challenge with working for Tony Robbins is he teaches you how to be an entrepreneur. You give your best stuff away for free. People will say, this is so good. What else you got? You are remarkable at how you just explained that. You are so good at this. I can see the 30,000 hours. I do not let it go until it works. But if you really want results, if you're really serious, I'll inspire you. I'll get your wheels turning. I know that this is possible for so many people. This is just the tip of the iceberg, my friend. Your new book is so specific. You give over templates. You tell people like literally how to go off and start a business. What was going through my mind was, aren't you afraid of giving away all your secrets? <laughs> I think that's the best way to run a business. Give it away for free. Give your best stuff up right in the beginning because I have this philosophy. If you give your best stuff away for free, people will say, this is so good. What else you got? And I've got a whole lot more that people don't know that's not in this book, but this is where they need to start. So I think it's the best way to run a business. I mean, it, it starts to though, I've worked with tons of companies over the years who are like afraid to share, like they have a software, but they don't want to share screenshots or they don't want to talk about the research and development. Or you know, if you're a small business person or consultant or coach, heck, if you're a contractor, you're like worried if I share too much, they could just go off and do it themselves. Or worse, my competitors are watching, right? Like, like the thing that makes me awesome is my secret sauce. And if I give it away, why would anyone trust me or work with me or pay me for my services? So the way I look at it is I have so much free content out there. I have over 500 podcasts, tons of content on my website, tons of interviews I've done. And I do definitely walk people through the step-by-step -step of how to get started with a business. I'm also known for helping people create digital courses. So I'll talk a lot about how to get started with a digital course, how to take your knowledge, your know-how, your skill set, and get into a course that you can make profitable and scale your business. All of that is out there. But here's what people pay for. They pay for the roadmap, the step-by-step -step guide. Tell me how to do it in a sequence that will get me results. Sure, all my stuff is out there for free, but if you really want results, if you're really serious, you don't want to hunt and peck all over the web to get this result. I'll inspire you. I'll get your wheels turning. I'll get you starting to think, oh, I could do this. Okay, this is how you get started. But when you're serious about getting results, you will buy my course and say, Amy, walk me through step by step. And that's exactly what has happened in my business. It's the framework that people will pay for, the sequence that they're looking for. But your new book, Find the Courage to Quit Your Job, Make Money, Work Where You Want, and Change the World, literally is the framework. So for like less than $30 now, like it was writing the book a good idea? Absolutely. And if you really put it into context around what I do... So I wrote two weeks notice because I was that girl in the cubicle in my last nine to five job thinking, I don't even know what else I would do. Like, this is it for me. I'm always going to be a nine to five. Then I was introduced to this online world and everything changed for me. So my goal is to introduce people to this online marketing business building world. And once they get into it, once I give them the step by step, here's exactly how to create your foundation of of an online business, once they do that, there's so much more out there for them. I offer a lot more beyond just the book, but so do my peers. And so I'm passionate about introducing people to a world they don't even know exists, a world that could literally blow their minds if they actually take the courage to leave behind their nine to five job and get started. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, my friend. Now, part of what drives me and even in the mission for this podcast is I believe that it's worth pursuing your passions at all costs. And people really challenge me on that. And they really hate it when I say that. Because I believe that if you actually spent and carved out a little more time for the things that you love, and this doesn't have to be a business, but for me, it is. But it could be your artwork. It could be your creativity. It could be... Uh, my wife is an actress. And so it's her in community theater. Like, If you placed your passions and pursued them with all of your being, with everything that you have, and you actually put yourself in there and prioritized it over yeah. the, sometimes the kids or the spouse or your boss or all of these other things. If you did it at all costs, because it will cost you something, you will turn more into the person you want to be. You will start to build new confidence. You will start to meet new people. You will start to go into new worlds. Like Your life can open up to be the most beautiful thing if you simply do that with everyone that you've helped. Again, tens of thousands of people. 
and your own success over the last 14 years with your own business. And we're going to get into the ups and downs. Is my <laughs> am I right? <laughs> or are those people who think that I'm not telling the truth, are they right? <laughs> So I absolutely think you are right. There's no doubt. And, and oh, I'm, okay, I'm good. A, yes. <laughs> and I'm an example of that. Although there's one little caveat there. I often tell my students that you do not need to create a business that is 100% your passion. So stay with me here. What happens with a lot of my students who are coming out of a nine to five job and wanting to create their own business, they get stuck on well, what if this isn't my passion? I'm not sure what my passion is. I think it's this, but but I don't know. And then they don't do anything. So the business I have, the way I've made multi-million dollars is that I teach people how to create digital courses. So the book is the beginning. But once people get into my world and they want to create a business, and they want to scale, I teach people how to take their knowledge and know-how and turn that into a profitable digital course. Now, that's what I do in my business. That's how I got to almost $80 million over the last 14 years. However, digital courses are not my passion. I don't wake up in the morning and think, I can't wait to teach someone how to create a digital course. That is my business, but that is not my passion. What my passion is and what I've learned over the years, I didn't even know this the last day I was in my nine to five job and became an entrepreneur the next day. I didn't know this at the time, but my passion is helping people realize that there is freedom out there for them to get, that where they're at right now is just scratching the surface. And there's this whole other world that they can create on their terms to build a business and a life that they absolutely love, to have financial freedom, creativity freedom, lifestyle freedom. I'm passionate about getting them into this world so they can have a better life. That's what I live for. My vehicle just happens to be what I do in my business. So I do think that's an important distinction so it won't stop people in their tracks from starting a business. I love that. And that's something that I have... Um, you know, I've been doing this for long enough now. I started my agency again in 2006. And I've noticed that every two or three years, it's almost like a different chapter. It's a different business because the market changes and people change. And when I started, my goal was... I was 23. My wife had no income because she was at home with my four-month-old daughter. And I was like, I'm going to quit my job. And I'm going to start this production company because I went to school for film. So naturally, I must... like, I have a skill. I'm going to use course. it. And now that I look back, I realize every two years or three years it changed. And I've learned and the market has changed and things have changed. And I could never have guessed where we were going. YouTube was like brand new. Long form video wasn't a thing when I started. We shot everything on tape. Like I had, I was not a futurist who anticipated <laughs> Facebook. I just got my first Facebook profile because it was a brand new thing because someone turned to me and said, Oh, uh, it's a great way to share photos. Like that was the world I started in. Yes. And then yet over time was able to build a multi-million dollar agency and a team of 24 people. But where I'm going with this is through all the ups and downs, I always have this fear in the back of my mind with like, I'm really excited about this idea. I'm really excited about this next chapter. I'm really excited about this product or this service or I could imagine it working this way. But what if when I get there, I don't like it? Oof. What if I build a trap for myself? What if I'm the, the doctor, you know, the physician who goes, who wants to be a doctor so badly and goes through all of the pre med and all of the medical school and then goes through the residency and then finds themselves with $300,000 in debt and they find themselves being a doctor and they realize they hate working in a hospital? <laughs> uh, yeah, it happens for sure. Actually, it happened to me. So let's talk about this because it can absolutely happen and you can still thrive in building a business. So when I left my nine to five job, I decided... Which was at... You're, you're, I, I mean, you've worked with Harley Davidson and you've worked with a bunch of brands. and But your last nine to five job was at Tony Robbins company, yeah. right? Yes. So actually, let's back up for a minute. So my last job was with Tony Robbins and I was the director of content development. So for about six and a half years, I got to travel the world with Tony and the team to London, Philippines, Fiji. I mean, it was incredible. And I worked on the content that he did on stage, like Unleash the Power Within, Date with Destiny. I got to be a part of that. It was incredible to say the least. And I loved my job and I traveled a lot, but then I got married and realized, wait a second, I am never home. This job is incredibly demanding and 
I was in a meeting where Tony brought in a bunch of internet marketers. I talk about this in the very beginning of my book where he brought in a bunch of business owners and they all ran their business online. So they did dating, real estate, investing, so many different topics. You would know the guys that were at the table, Frank Kern, Brendan Bouchard, Jeff Walker, Evan Pagan, John Reese. I mean, really big titans in the online marketing space. I didn't know any of them. I was brought this into like, the meeting. This is like 15 years ago. So so yeah. we're, we're talking like, like 2008. Is that when this is? Yes. Yes. So that would actually be right. It was 2008 because I remember about a year after that, I quit. And so, and I quit at the end of 2009. So yes. So basically I was brought into this meeting to take notes. That's how humbling this story is. I wasn't invited to the main table. There were no women at the main table. It was all these internet marketing guys. And they went around and they talked about their businesses. And all I heard was freedom. They talked about calling the shots, building their own business, being creative, making tons of money, making tons of impact. And I thought, I have no idea what they're doing. Like they had digital courses and memberships and masterminds, but I didn't know that world well. So I thought, I have no idea what they're doing, but I've never been free in my life. I want that kind of freedom. I don't want a boss anymore. No matter how great Tony is, I didn't want a boss. And I realized I need to do something about this. But I thought, I have no skill that would actually translate to owning my own business, to an entrepreneurship. And being an entrepreneur was never even part of my vocabulary. I never aspired to be an entrepreneur. So can I ask, at the time yeah. when you're working for Tony, were you like... So you were like, I, I have my book here from, you know, Unleash the Power Within and, <laughs> and I have my other, I have my other books and stuff. So like, I worked to help on those workbooks. Yeah. So just to help paint a picture, because this is 2008. I remember, you know, we, we were talking at the time about web 2.0 because, yes. because guess what? Twitter is a thing and social media <laughs> is a thing and, and all this stuff, but it wasn't the world that it is today. Not and there all. was no one like you making courses and books and saying, here you go. And so you were working in like a paper world. Right? Very much. I mean, I was working with DVDs for a long oh, time yeah. with Tony. Oh, yeah. yeah. DVDs and CDs, right? Oh, he would. I remember absolutely. he would open his CD and he'd be like, congratulations, because most people wouldn't pick this up. Most people wouldn't pop it in. Most people won't even finish this thing. And I was like, so true. I was like, oh, I'm special because I just popped it in. <laughs> exactly. So yes, that was my world. It was a very different world. Social media was the wild, wild west. I remember the first day Tony got on Twitter. Like it all was very, very new during this time. I started to dabble with social media while I was still at Robbins, and I did have that skill set. So I thought, you know what? Maybe I'll start a side hustle. Maybe at nighttime and in the mornings and weekends, I'll start getting some clients and do their social media. So that was the only thing I could think of that people would pay me for. And that's what I did. I started to take courses, listen to podcasts, learn all I could about social media even more. Like I didn't know enough yet. So after that meeting, I started to educate myself more. Then I started a little side hustle, took a few clients doing their social media. And then six months after that, I actually went out and started my own business. I had a few clients, not enough to cover my salary, but I thought it's now or never. So my point being getting back to you saying the fear of going through all of this, then you realize you don't love it. I started my business. I was doing social media for small businesses and I hated every <laughs> minute of it. Hated it. What happened was instead of having one big boss, literally Tony's a big guy, I had like eight mini bosses. My clients that I allowed them to treat me like I was their employee. They're bossing me around every minute of the day. I was so overwhelmed. I did not enjoy working one-on-one. -on -one. I don't do that anymore. And it wasn't something that I thought I could do this forever. And in my mind, I thought, if this is what entrepreneurship is, I'm going to go beg for my job back. This is not what I love. I yeah. did it for two years until I finally said, screw this. I hate this. I got to change. Well, we talk about you know how much the COVID changed the world. Uh, right before COVID hit with my creative production company, we were doing a little over 200 projects a year. And we would have between 30 and 40 clients on the go at any given time. Whoa. And um, let's just say, <laughs> I didn't realize how burnt out I was getting until COVID showed up and everything went on pause. And I, I felt free. Like yes. I, felt, I felt free for the first time. And I used to think to myself, and I wouldn't say this out loud, that it bothered me that for my clients or my staff 
or the people in my life, the business we were building was a step on their career path. Mm. But for me, it felt like a chain around my ankle mm. because I put all of my everything into it. But I knew that everything I was building was my net worth, was my self-worth, was what people thought of me and my whole reputation. And anyone could learn something in my company and then go off to something else. But I yeah. felt like if I stopped doing this, if I stopped doing the hundreds of projects a year, and we stopped having 30 or 40 projects on the go at a given time, if we stopped being able to make our seven-figure payroll, then what was, what was it all for? Yeah. And it was only after COVID that I started realizing, oh, you know, in the decade plus I've been doing this, I've learned some things. Like, it's not that I was just putting out projects. Like, like I've learned some things. And the things that now come easy to me didn't used to come easy to me. Yes. The things that come easy to me do not come easier to other people. Yes. And it's taken me actually a few years to realize that it's okay for me to let go of some of that stuff because I have knowledge and I have experience and I have these things. And for the longest time, I thought like, why would anyone like me? Why would anyone listen to me? Why would anyone trust me if I don't have the machine behind me? Yes. That's something that we all struggle with, especially today if you're starting something. It's like, who am I to have all this stuff? You almost discount the very experiences you have, don't you? Oh, absolutely. I think that's the one reason why a lot of people do not start a business because they have skills and knowledge that they think is just normal, that everybody knows what they know, or it's just too easy, or no one would pay for this. And one of the things that I teach in the book is called the sweet spot. So the sweet spot is what I use to help all my students figure out what kind of business they want to create or what kind of digital course they want to create or whatever it might be. So picture it in four quadrants. So there's four quadrants. One, two, three, four. Let's start with this one up here. So the first quadrant is when you're thinking about what you could create, what kind of business you want to have, you want to think about where have you gotten results? It's important that you've gotten results before you teach or do for somebody else. So where have you gotten results in your personal life, in your business life? What do people ask you about all the time? What comes easy to you? What could you talk about all day long? You need to think about your strengths, your knowledge, your skill set, and you need to to not be humble here. Like really just let it out. It's worth a five, 10 minute journal session just to get it all out. Where are your strengths? What are you good at? Where have you gotten results? The can, can, I, can, I just, yep. can I just say on this point? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of us don't like to accept compliments. Oh, yeah. And when people tell you, you know, I've had people say, wow, you're really good at this. And I go, oh, you know, th thank you. And I would like discount it. And then finally, I decided about a year and a half ago to, to listen and like to make note. Yes. If someone's like, oh, you're kind of good at this. Or if I'm talking and people lean in, yes. or if people ask a lot of follow-up questions, I started taking note. And then I realized over two or three months, it's like, wow, a, 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 lot, of, <laughs> a lot of people are giving me these indicators that maybe I'm good at this. Maybe they recognize something that I don't even see in myself. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm talking about. Pay attention to those cues. They're everywhere and document them. I like that you say document them because I think you're going to want to come back to them. So absolutely, totally on the same page there. The second quadrant is who do you want to serve and what are they struggling with? So when you start to think about your strengths, your results, what you're good at, start thinking about who you could help. What kind of problems can you solve for the people that you want to help? Because it's important that those two are aligned. Every business is solving a problem. And so we need to make sure you know who you want to work with and what problem you want to solve. The third quadrant is what are people paying for? So I'm all about you making money. And we need to make sure that this idea you have, this thing you want to do, we need to make sure that it is a viable offer that people would pay for. Now, the first thing I'm going to say is something that people always shy away from. So if other people are doing it and making money with it, that is a good sign. That is a great validator. But what happens is, let's say you want to start a business and you want to help dogs with their separation anxiety and you want to create a whole membership around this and a podcast and you look around and you think, this has already been done. And it's actually been done by someone that's doing really well. They're like really high up on the charts. They're killing it. There's no room for me. That is such bullshit. There's no truth to that whatsoever. I don't ever think I've said bullshit in an interview in my entire life. It's bullshit. 
<laughs> I have had so many blue ocean, like I don't know if people are familiar with the blue ocean, red ocean term, but when people come to me and go, I'm going to create something brand new, I always have to remind them if it's brand new, people aren't looking for it. They don't, they're not ready for it. They don't understand it. Like you need to work so hard to try and even explain to people what this thing is. And it might make you feel special to be so different. But, you know, Richard Branson is someone who I think we can all learn a lot from. And he's gone into every business by just saying, well, I just want to look at an industry where people understand it, know it, can easily buy it. Yes. But they just don't do it well. I just, I, I want to come in oh. and just do it better than everyone else. And it's like, and you don't even need to be a lot better. Some businesses are so bad. Like you so just bad. have to be a little bit better. Okay. And here's the truth. I know everyone listening who's thought about creating a business. When you look around and people are doing what you want to do, I know when you're all alone and no one knows what you're thinking in your head, you're thinking, I could do it better that they don't even know what they're talking about, or they don't have the kind of education I have or the kind of experiences I could do that better. So go do it better. But yeah. I love the idea that it's already been done before. First to market is an amazing thing. It's rare. Most people aren't going to thrive there. So find out where people are spending money. Are there books about it? Podcasts about it? Digital courses, memberships, all that. Like is money being spent in this area that you want to be in? If the answer is yes, that is a very good sign. I was going to say the other thing that has kept me going for so many years is because I'm mission driven and I have high standards and I believe in what we're doing, even when I look at someone else in the market and I go, oh man, they're so good and they're so big and they're so established and I don't know if we can be as good. I'm kind of like looking up. Yes. But there's a lot of people who pay for services who are actually down. Yes. Like, and when I run into them and I'm talking to an entrepreneur or a business owner, I'm talking to someone and I go, hold on, you spent how much money? And, and what happened? And how yes. bad was it? And I feel bad for them. And so I remind myself that like... I, I almost feel like I'm doing you a service. Like if you don't pick me to come in because I at least trust me and I know I'm honorable and I know I'm going to do good work and I know I'm not going to cheat you. Like if you don't pick me, I feel bad for you. And, <laughs> and so if there's other people out there, especially if people are spending money on stuff that's not very good, exactly. I use that as a motivator for myself because I almost feel like it's a gift I'm giving you to work right? with me because I'm here You're to save welcome. you. <laughs> Yes, exactly. So there's a lot of work to be done in that quadrant three, where are people spending money? But there's some work to do on your mindset, knowing that you do not need to be first to market. And if other people are doing it, you are on the right track. So that's the third quadrant. The fourth quadrant is one of the most important, and it has to light you up. Whatever you create, I want it to light you up. Notice I did not say it has to be your passion. It just has to light you up because you're going to talk about it morning, noon, and night. I mean, what you and I do, I'm pretty sure we talk about it every single day. Think about it all the time. Think about making it better, diving into it. It becomes your life. Like my business is my baby for sure. And so it has to light you up. So again, it's the sweet spot. This idea is starting to validate an idea you might have for your business. Quadrant one, where have you gotten results? What is your knowledge, skill set? What do people go to you for? Number two, who do you want to serve and what problem do you want to solve for them? Number three, what are people paying for? And number four, what lights you up? This is where you start in terms of starting to think about what might I do to create a business? I, I just have to say, you know, you are remarkable at how you just explained that. And for anyone listening and anyone... I mean, if you're watching on YouTube, if I can just be a, a bit of a director for a second, you know, Amy, the way that you're speaking, the way that you're finishing your thoughts clearly, the way you're looking at camera without blinking awkwardly, like you are so good at this. I can see that the 30,000 hours, I'm not even gonna say 10,000 hours. I can see <laughs> how good it is you are at this. And I have to assume that it's from immersion. Mm. You know, I was at a Tony Robbins event and he likes to say, you know, if you want to learn what, if you want to learn Japanese, where do you go? Right. If you want to learn Italian, where do you go? You like, you go there, you immerse yourself in it. Yes. And that last quadrant that you spoke about, the idea of it has to be the thing that lights you up. Yeah. Is, uh, I just had this thought last week and it hit me that the fact that I love what we're doing right now, like I love interviewing people. And I didn't even realize that 10 or 15 years ago, before I had a podcast, before I did this, I would listen to talk radio. And I didn't even oh. like talk radio because I don't like politics. But I would <laughs> listen to talk radio and I would think to myself, I could do what that host was doing. Exactly. And then in the back of my mind, I had this little like, 
Who are you to say that, man? Uh, Come on, you're in your car, you're in traffic. You really think you could carry an hour? And I would watch for some reason. I just found myself drawn to uh, the biography of um, oh, who's the CNN guy, uh, King Larry King. Okay. And, and and for some reason, I'm listening to Larry King's biography about how, what he did in the 60s and 70s. And then I noticed that like all the books I'm reading and all the things I'm watching, yeah. it's not that they're all related to exactly what I want to do. But the lessons I'm learning from mm. them and the stories I'm holding on to, it's almost like my mind is filtering out everything except for what I want to see. Yes. And it's this immersion. Yes. It's this why I say pursue your passions kind of, and we can even say then what lights you up at mm. all costs. It's because if you keep gating yourself, if you keep blocking off the things, if you think that an hour from now or, or a week from now, I'm going to hold time to look into that thing because you have to work at it, you're closing yourself off from the everyday. My, my daughter's in competitive dance. Every time she hears a song, she's thinking dance. I'm not thinking dance. <laughs> I'm thinking like, oh, what would the producer do? And what would the writer think? Right. Like, like, we all look at it differently. And so for everyone who's watching, again, I started off by saying you're so good at this because you've been immersed in this, but you didn't start this oh, good. Oh my right? goodness. Oh my goodness. Okay, wait, let's talk about that. So the first video I ever made, it was in a hotel room. I was at some marketing conference. There's a bed behind me, which is just like a weird vibe right away. And I have a really ridiculous haircut and I look terrified. And so, and I have hated video for years. I talk about this in the book because I have always been self-conscious of how I look, my weight, how I sound. Am I going to say the right things? And in the very beginning, this was a big one for me. When I left my job, I went home and started making videos. I don't even know why, because I was terrified, but I started making videos. And my husband said, I see you making these marketing videos every day. I don't see them anywhere. Where are you posting them? And I said, I'm not. I, I'm terrified to post anything. And he said, why? And I said, because I'm terrified of what Tony Robbins and my old coworkers are going to think. They're going to watch these videos and think, uh, who is she to be doing yeah. this? She looks ridiculous. She sounds ridiculous. Like she needs to come back for her nine to five job. I was terrified of what they were going to think. And my sweet husband says to me, babe, I love you dearly, but I need to give you some tough love. Tony Robbins is not watching your videos, critiquing what you're doing. He's got an empire to build. He's doing his own thing. And your old coworkers, they're not paying as much attention as you think they are as well. And if they have an opinion, are they paying the bills? If they don't pay the bills, they don't get an opinion. And so early on, I had to stop worrying about what everyone was going to think of me or I would do none of it. So video has been this thing for me that you're right total immersion. I can't even believe how many videos I've made. And I need to tell anyone watching right now who is scared to put their videos out. I was too for years. When Facebook Live came about many, many years ago, I swear in my mind, I thought, I hope it crashes and burns. I hope this never works on Facebook. <laughs> You're like, I, that's how much I, I hate video. I don't have to do this. Yes. Exactly. I love what you said earlier about this idea of, you know, what I'm good at now, I wasn't good at then. What comes easy to me now is not what it was like then. Because getting back to me creating a business, I absolutely hated. One thing that I really talk about a lot in the book is that what you start with is not the end all be all. It's not set in stone. You have to get started. Action creates clarity. But once you get started, you'll start to see, oh, people like this or, oh, they're gravitating toward this, or I'm really good at this. Your business will morph over the years. I don't want you to be chasing every shiny object, but I want you to be paying attention to what people are actually responding to. The business I have today looks dramatically different than the business I started, and that is very normal. So if I can ask, I feel like for anyone who's being introduced to this, it's like blowing their mind right now. But, but people who have been business for a few years or, yeah. or entrepreneurs... Maybe listening to what you're saying and thinking in the back of their mind, like the golden age of online marketing, the golden age of you know Facebook and Instagram advertising or cheap ads or selling courses is past, right? Like if if you can't do, then teach. That the world is filled with with people who are only famous because they're famous. They only make money in business selling courses to people who can't make money in business. Do you know what I mean? Like there's yeah. this there's this real negativity that's out there 
How would you respond to that? I would say that I have proof everywhere that that is not true. You know, recently I was in a mastermind and I sat around a table with all these amazing entrepreneurs and many of them were a lot younger than me and they were doing incredibly cool things and not just what I'm doing, like so very different. And it made me think about all my students. And I talk a lot about them in my book, Two Weeks Notice, about what they've been able to do. And I do not think that that is how you make money online or that's the only way. Like I have students who, there was this woman, she was a nurse and she would see moms rush into the emergency room with their kid choking or something wrong and they wouldn't know what to do. And this kid literally is on the brink of death. And the mom's like, here, fix this, like last minute kind of stuff. And she thought, I need to teach moms how to take care of their kids in an emergency situation like choking or whatever that might be. And so she decided to create a course all around helping moms save their babies in these emergency settings. Boom, $850,000 in her first year, going from a nurse to actually taking something she knew and creating it for the world. I see this everywhere from baking to dog walking to therapy to fixing people's relationships. Like there's so many different topics that are thriving and there's not just one way to do it. So in the book, I talk about different business models, creating digital courses, absolutely one way, but there's so many different things you could do from small group coaching, one-on-one coaching, consulting, masterminds, memberships, physical products. So I just say this to get people excited that you don't even know what's out there for you yet until you start. And it will, you'll find your way. You'll find your business model. You know, I mentioned earlier, kind of in jest, how Tony Robbins started off this CD set that I had many years ago (laughs) with like most people wouldn't buy this. Most people wouldn't pop it in, you know, in, in your car. I was driving at the time. Most people won't listen. Most people won't complete it. And truthfully, it's a little bit painful that like I have all these books behind me that I love. Most people buy books and never read them. If they read them, they don't retain the information. If they retain the information, they won't actually put it into practice. And I made the decision last year, two things. First, I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to be the dumbest guy all the time. Because I used to really pride myself on how quick I was and how smart I was and my retention. And like... And I wanted to prove to people how smart I was. And I was like, you know what? I'll I'll get so much further if I'm just an idiot in every room I'm in. And people are way more forgiving of you if you're an idiot because you're more humble. True. But the other thing is I've also... As an entrepreneur and a creative, I always think that I can come up with a better way to do everything. And so now I'm making a real effort to just be like, they've already done the work. They've already tested this. They're literally giving you the secret formula, Mark. Just follow the process and do what they say. And it's like, it must drive you crazy that you do all of this work and you almost have to beg people (laughs) to just try it. Oh my goodness. Okay. So this is such a big topic. It's such an important topic. So when I worked for Tony Robbins, one of the biggest lessons I learned is that there is no need to recreate the wheel. The most smartest entrepreneurs will find someone who's already done what you want. And if they're willing to share their model, take in everything that they teach, and then you create your own version of that. And he actually goes on to say, those that continually recreate the will, start from scratch, those entrepreneurs that are more seasoned and watching this right now, if you're always starting over, you always have new projects, you literally are stunting your growth in your revenue. Hey, and just so you know, that's that's also me. And my, my team wants me to lay it. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah. yeah. So yeah, you yeah, crave yeah. variety. I want... I mean, if we're going to go through the values, I mean, certainty and uh, and significance are, are were my main drivers and are. But I like starting. I'm like a 20% guy. Idea, start, go. And then when I don't get a little traction, I either get bored with it because of ADHD or I go, no, what's next? What's next? What's next? And I just don't leave... Have I don't give things enough time to go through the like figuring it out and the painful process and trying and testing. And I, and, and I also now realize I rob myself of the lessons and the learning and and the compound interest that comes from seeing things through. So, okay, I love yeah. your vulnerability and your honesty in that. Most people in your place would not have just admitted that. So, I think that's pretty cool that you did and I think some <laughs> other people needed to hear like they see you being successful doing this big show, making things happen, but you still struggle with that. And there's definitely things in my life that I still struggle with 14 years later starting this business. So one, thank you for sharing that. I think some people needed to hear it. And the second thing I'll say is that 
I really do want to make a case for creating something and sticking with it. And I talk a lot about this in the book about how not reinventing the will, but finding something that works and really doubling down makes a difference. So let me tell you a quick story. When I was first starting out in those first two years of creating a business I absolutely hated, I decided I'm going to create a digital course and teach people how to do Facebook marketing. Facebook marketing, again, was the Wild West. Everyone in their brother was teaching it for the record. So I came into an industry where there was already big, big names doing it and I found my way. So there's proof right there, you can too. But, oh, here comes my dog barreling in. So he just <laughs> wants to say hello. Name? This is Scout. And he just got back from a walk. Okay. Aww. So yes. I, I, Scout, I for our listeners, it looks like a golden doodle. Is, is that yes. right? Yeah. Labradoodle. Yep. A labradoodle. So, so cute. Okay. Yeah, so you launched your first course. Launched my first Facebook. course. I'm, I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to teach people how to do Facebook marketing. Actually, let me back up. My first course was more just social media in general. I'm going to teach people how to do social media. Is this the one that made $267? $267. (laughs) And I thought I would make $100,000 because I look around and it looks like everyone else is making tons of money. And I came from Tony Robbins. Like, I should know my stuff. You should. You should have actually, right? And I did not. I did not. I didn't really know how to create a course at the time. And I sure as heck didn't know how to market it. And I didn't know how to grow an email list. All the things I teach in my book because they're essential. But here's what I wanted to point out. In last year, we made $15 million selling digital courses. So 14 years later, $15 million. My first year, $267. $267. If I said, I'm not cut out for this. This is too hard. I can't figure this out. I'm going to try memberships now. I'm going to try a mastermind now. I would never be sitting here today saying, I wrote a book called Two Weeks Notice to help people grow their businesses because I know what I'm talking about. I wouldn't know what I was talking about. So I'm making a case for figure out something. Uh, even if it didn't work the first time, stick with it. The second time I launched $10,000. The third time I launched $30,000. Soon after, I almost had a million dollar launch. Like it happens quickly if you stick with it. But I am the kind of dog with a bone kind of girl where I do not let it go until it works. Now there's some exceptions, but usually that's my track record. So two thoughts, you know, Bob Odenkirk says in his memoir, he's an actor and a writer. He was on Saturday Night Live and he had Mr. Show and he plays uh, Saul in Better Call Saul. And yes, there was a 10 year period where he was really hot and then nothing happened. Nothing happened for 10 years. Now, nothing happened that we could see. Every year he directed a movie, he put out a pilot, he worked, he worked, he worked. He had like two or three projects every single year for 10 years straight and nothing hit. And he said, you know, the, the truth is I worked just as hard as the things that didn't work as the things mm. that did. And Amen there's a certain amount of luck and there's a certain amount of time and fitting in. But to go back, you know, on your first course, when you launch it, $267. But at the same time, my understanding is like you're just coming out of like you and your husband, uh, Hobie, you know, had debt. You had mm-hmm. debt when you launched your business, $40,000 in debt. Your husband's quitting his job as a <laughs> carpenter to become a firefighter. Yes. And so if we go back to then where it's like, okay... I I don't really know. What I'm, this is me talking in your place. I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm trying this cool thing. I should be so much better because I came from this high status company with this high status role. I'm not making money. I'm carrying debt. My husband's quitting his job. And if we flash forward today, as you mentioned, $15 million revenue last year. But on top of that now, your husband is retired. You have a new place in Nashville that you've been working on. You have a lake house. Like... And and I the reason I bring it up is because I, I want to spend a little bit of time focused on you and your marriage and the people in your life who've supported you along the way. But, but you guys could never have anticipated when you started getting to where you are today, could you? Absolutely not. It feels like yesterday that I was sitting in a little condo in Carlsbad at this little kitchen table crying to a girlfriend that we are in debt. My business isn't working. Hobie's not a firefighter yet. I don't know what we're going to do. It was terrible. So never in my wildest dreams. And are you a better version of who you were then because you've cast off a lot of things that were holding you back? Or do you think you've moved into a different version of you and you don't even recognize kind of that humble, down and out woman you may have been? I, my gut was to say, I don't even recognize who I am in the best possible way. 
So when I think about her, she was plain small, didn't even know what it looked like to play big on her own, terrified at every turn in very little confidence and really genuinely never, ever aspired to be where I am today. I wanted to do good in the world. I wanted to make a great living, but nothing like I have now. That was not what I was aspiring to. And when I look at myself now and I think about what I've accomplished and what I've done in my business, I feel as though I have morphed into an entirely different person. Someone that takes risks, someone that's willing to get uncomfortable every freaking day, someone that will play big no matter what. And I say all this because I know that this is possible for so many people. And it's not just me. I'm not just lucky or talented or anything like that. It's because I stuck with it. That is literally <laughs> what happened. I just did not give up. I was, and, and here's the thing. In the book, I, one of the very first things I give my readers is this opportunity to choose their why. Why do you want to go out on your own and be your own boss? And I do this early on in the book because without a why, I would have absolutely been knocking on the door saying, please take me back to my job. Like this is not working. So for me, I didn't want to be told what to do, when to do it, or how to do it. I didn't want to be on someone else's time or someone else's dime. I knew what I wanted. My why today is so much more rich and better and about other people. But that minute, my why was about me. And it's okay to have a selfish why. It was the only thing that walked me out the door to become my own boss. But yes, I would never even recognize myself today. And I don't think a lot of people in my life back then uh, would recognize me either. They'd say the same thing. And so if, if you're comfortable talking a bit about your marriage, and I know that you've shared this before on, on your podcast, uh, which is just crushing. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, like tens of millions of downloads and some of the most amazing guests and, and as well, like really tactical information on, on everything that we're talking about, starting a business and launching a course and marketing and advertising and mindset and entrepreneurship and relationships and finance. But what really caught my interest is, I mean, I've been fortunate. I met my wife in high school. We're high school sweethearts. We've been, we've been together. <laughs> every woman reacts I that way. That. And every dude does not. But uh, <laughs> we've been together 23 years now and married for... We're going on 18. Married 18 years. Um, so I'm lucky because my wife agreed to come on this journey with me. And I had to kind of convince her. But a few years ago, I kind of said, why do you just let me do whatever I want? And she said, I trust you. I, like, mm. I just, I trust that you have at this point my, our, our best interests. Yes. In heart. But what's so uh, remarkable, I think, about your story is first of all, you're, you, you have a heart for women entrepreneurship. I do. For women entrepreneurs, for, for women who are, Absolutely. who feel, and, and it may be true or not true, but feel stuck at home, stuck in business, not progressing up the corporate ladder, not at the CEO's table, not being invited to the board of directors. And there's all kinds of reasons why that's continuing to happen. But entrepreneurship is a way out. But you know, there are a lot of women who may be in a relationship and their significant other might not be comfortable with it. Yes. Uh, uh, might be in control of the finances, might have their own dominance issues or ego issues. And so your husband Hobie, who sounds like a lovely man, but you know he's a veteran who you know you've, you've described him as an alpha male, very you know, much so. <laughs> uh, you know, an athlete, uh, a combatant. You know that he comes at your problems like with guns blazing and like uh. like let's go, and he tries to amp you up. But what's interesting is at a certain point in your relationship, like you make way more money, and he's now retired, and so spouses, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, the people in your life have to come along on this journey with you. And my wife used to have so much resentment for me mm. because she, she was at home with four kids. Whoa. And she would say, well, at least you get to go out. And I would say, yeah, but I'm like working 15 hours a day. Working. Yeah. And she'd go, well, at least you get time to yourself. And I said, yeah, but that's sitting in traffic because I commute 25,000 miles a year. And at least you get this and at least you get that. And I would say, well, at least you get to wake up whenever you, you know, you get to go back <laughs> in bed and you get to read books. Like, yeah. I don't get to read books and you get to do this and this. And we all we saw is what the other person got to do. And we had so much resentment. How do you and your husband, Hobie, manage that? Like, mm. how do, how do you, what advice do you give for those of us listening who are going to, about to jump into a new business and, and we need people to, to be on our team, on our side? 
Yes. Okay. So I think it starts with respect, but don't worry. There's a lot of resentment in this story. So uh, definitely <laughs> okay, lay it on me. All the yeah, resentment. <laughs> there, there was resentment for sure. You know, uh, yesterday we were putting a pitch together for a morning show for my book and the PR agent put this pitch together and the title was how I retired my husband. And I knew instantly Hobie would not like that. Like it, yeah. he says, I feel like it's demeaning. Emasculated? Emasculated, yeah. absolutely, to to say that you retired your husband. And I said, babe, just go with it. Like then we, we, we talked about it, but we kind of had a laugh about it because he's like, I don't love it. And here's why. And and let me tell you why that came up. He feels as though he has helped me all along the way, which he has from day one. He feels part of this business in terms of being a sounding board, a cheerleader, giving me insight and feedback. He cannot tell you how much a conversion is on my opt-in page or anything about Facebook ads or funnels. He hates all of it, actually. It's not his jam, but he does love supporting me through this process and he feels part of it. So this idea of I retired my husband, he's like, uh, we did this together and we came to this conclusion together that I was going to retire. For those wondering, he retired because he was a San Diego firefighter. He's 50 years old. When you come to Nashville, you have to start from scratch. And he's like, I am not starting over. Like, I'm good. And so anyway, in the beginning, Hobie was a contractor and I was just starting my business. And we basically were making the same amount in year one. By year two, I was already passing him up. And then by year three, by far. And we had a meeting in our tax guy's office and the tax accountant, he looks at me and he says, this is how much you made. It was a couple million. And this is how much you made. It might've been 60,000 as a firefighter. And Hobie said, I had to take a moment. Like that was very hard for him. I grew up with a dad that made all the money. My mom didn't work. So right away, this was weird to me that I was making more money than my husband. But then I had this very alpha male who was working. I mean, this is sad. He's saving lives. I'm teaching people how to make money online and I'm making more money right there. The whole thing's unfair. But he did say I had this moment that I, I just had to think, oh, the, something shifted here. This, this is different now. And then we had to communicate and communicate and communicate about how do you feel about this? What do you think about this? Also, my husband has the same view as yours. I'm on the road having a good time. I just went to Napa for a mastermind. I'm flying and uh, going here and there. And I have a whole other world. He always says, you have a whole other world that I'm not involved in. And so my point being, is that you have to have a lot of conversations about this and it's not all rainbows and sunshine. And also um, when we talk about how much I work, there is resentment in that sometimes. He sees me working so hard, but that means I'm less time in our marriage. There's always resentment there we have to talk about. And then when he decided to retire, when we were still in California, before we moved, I looked at him and I said, I am afraid I am going to resent you. I'm afraid that I'm doing working. You don't have to. And I'm going to look at your life and think this is unfair. And what yeah. I, I love what he said, he said, the minute that happens, we talk about it. We will always just discuss it. We will always work it out. Mm. So anyway, it comes down to communication, but it hasn't been like the smoothest road because we have very different views of what traditional marriages look like. Uh. That's so interesting. I would encourage anyone in a relationship starting a business, whether you happen to come from a faith back or background or not, five love languages. Just understand yes. your partner, how they want love and, and give love because my wife's is quality time. So is, is my the, husband, is, which is hard for that me. That is the least important thing to me. Like, oh my gosh. Like, I had a friend once who came by and uh, for dinner and it was so awkward. It was like, I, I struggled to keep conversations going. There were long pauses. We, like, we finally just played a game. The next day they come in to work and they're like, that was fun. Thank you. I was like, were you at the same dinner? Like, I was like, were you, were you even there? What are you talking uh, about? I was like, it was, I'm sorry, but it was painful, right? Like, like we didn't do anything and we didn't like, that's what visiting is. And I was just visiting and I was like, what is this visiting thing? you? Okay. Speak we are so the same. Yeah. I come out of my skin. Yes. It's itchy. It makes me so yes. uncomfortable, but but my wife's is quality time and gifts. I've listened over 23 years. I've learned some strategies to be able to make this work. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I've just really actually over the last year just said, what would my wife do? Like, what would, she, what would she do? And, oh, she would spend money on this credit card out. Done, done, done. But mine is like acts of service Same. and words of affirmation. 
My <laughs> wife is not good at words. Uh, and she's learned to do some acts of service. But for her, it's like, I'll just do it or I won't do it. You do it or don't do it. I don't really care. And so it, we didn't know this for the first years. And, or we knew it, but didn't respect it. I think it's just so important, as you said, to talk about these things, to put yeah. them out there, to not be afraid of the hard conversations you may want to have. Because like you, when my teenage kids now, my son does this often, he'll say, oh, dad's upset because mom spent all his money. And I'll say, it's our money. God. Like, like she, if I could not have built a business if my wife was not taking care of everything. I, I mean, I, did, I didn't have way. to worry about anything. Of course, this was a team effort. But my wife didn't see it that way. And mm. so it's like, I wish I could go back and do a better job of just like reminding her <laughs> yes. and saying thank you. Maybe more. It's so true. That's so funny that it's quality time and access service for both of you. Same exactly with Hobie and I. But you know what you were talking? It made me think. I have a husband that has supported me from day one. Literally my biggest cheerleader. I it was really sweet. When my my galley of my book came in the mail, I was on yet another trip and Hobie was home and he doesn't read books. That's just not his thing. And he read the entire thing. And I actually thought he was lying until he started quoting stuff about list building. And I'm like, no, the guy really read the book. But the first page was dedicated to him. And he said, I had no idea you were going to dedicate this book to me. And I said, of course, I literally wouldn't have this business without you. But it makes me think of the women, especially that are listening right now, or the men that are in a different position that their spouse does not support them on this entrepreneurial journey. It's not something that they have a biggest cheerleader in their home for. And in the book, I write about the fact that when you decide to create your own business, be careful who you tell. So let's say you're still in your nine to five job and your goal is in six months, I'm out of here. Guard that dream with your life. Not everybody deserves to hear your dreams because they cannot handle it. They're either a natural naysayer and just don't believe that this is a good idea and we'll tell you all the reasons or they've wanted to do it and they haven't had the courage. So they're going to tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't. And if you're vulnerable enough, like most of us are when we're first leaving our job, you will believe everything they say. And I know that I would have. So when I decided to leave, I told three people and three people only. Hobie, my mom who thinks I can land on Mars and do anything, and my best friend. So only three people knew until the day I left and started my own thing. But someone's listening right now and they're like, yeah, but what if my husband is the person I shouldn't be telling? That he doesn't think that I should do this. He thinks it's a hobby and I should just do it on the side, but I want to do it full time. In the book, I write some scripts that you can use to share with your loved ones why this is important to you and what your plan is because you have to have the conversation with your spouse. It's not like you can't tell them, but here's the controversial part that not everyone's going to agree with me. If your spouse can't get on board, if they're like, I don't like this idea, don't do it, and you just can't see eye to eye on it, I still think you should do it. I still think you should find a way. You because have just, you have just, I'm so glad you're going to take the heat on that. Yeah, because I deep down inside, I was talking to someone the other day and I said, for many, many years, up until two years ago, my priorities were business, wife, kids. I can tell you that, that as a man, it's easy for me to say guilt-free. I don't, I don't say it out loud because <laughs> right. I'll, people will get mad at me. Right. But, and is it that but, order? Business, wife, to, kids? Today, it's I mean, not. if we're being really honest. It, it, it was business, wife, kids. Got today, it. Okay. Today, it's, today, it's wife, kids, business. Got it. And that's because I spent... Uh, COVID happened and we, we had this whole world shift and change. And I've spent yes. two years at home and all of this other stuff. But if I knew that I wanted to do something really big and really large... And I used to do this with my wife. I used to say, I'm sorry, honey. For the next three months, I really need to focus on this and I'm not going to be around. And I would ask for time. I would ask for time to, to do it. But I, I'm afraid to say this out loud for the hate. But do you not believe... I think you just said it. You have to put your business first. Right, like, like if you, if this is what you want to do, and you're called to do it, and you're driven to do it, you have to hope that you can bring the person around on board with you. But, but if you're not going to live your whole life for other people, then then you have to do this if for no other reason than to prove to your spouse that it's not as bad as they may think. <laughs> okay, so it's such a hard conversation to have. I don't know how to and, say this other than and, put yourself first. Put yourself first. I, I, it's true because here's what happens when you don't. It's like that ter that old saying about the put your face mask on or air mask. What's that thing yeah. called in the plane? 
<laughs> yeah, the uh, the emergency. The, yeah, the emergency mask. <laughs> yes, you put it on first, then you put it on someone else. And here's why I think that's so important. You're going to be resentful. If you have a dream to start a business and you want to change lives in whatever big or small way you want to do it, and you do not do it because your spouse says, it should just be a hobby, don't do it, you got to stay in your nine to five job, you will resent that person and it will infiltrate in all of your marriage, in all of your relationship. And so there's ways to continue to communicate until you guys get on the same page. But I do believe you put it first. And it's not necessarily I'm putting the business first. It's I'm putting my desires and dreams first so I could be a better person to this family. I really do believe that. If Hobie told me, don't do this, stay in your nine to five job, I would end up hating him for doing that to me. And so I think it's important. That is such a... That's actually the clarification that I've always needed. Thank you. Now, now I know how to articulate. It's not that that I was putting my business first. It's that I was putting my hopes and ideas and dreams first. And it feels selfish. It does. It feels self-centered. But yeah. but going all the way back to what I said, the growth, the, the confidence, the lessons, the person that you're becoming. Have you ever seen this movie? I don't remember what it's called, but it's this movie that came out with this woman who's blind. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and there's this there's this experimental surgery that might allow her to get her eyesight back. Have you seen this movie? It's on Netflix. No. So so I'm watching this movie with my wife, and it's kind of like a thriller or whatnot. But and I won't give it all away. But but she's married, and her husband is the best. He's there for her at every step. He's there all along the way, and and she really relies on him. And they have this codependent relationship. And he's pushing her to like get your eyesight back, get your eyesight back, get your eyesight back because she's never been able to have it. And she goes through this emergency surgery or this uh, experimental surgery and she gets her eyesight back. But what happens when she gets her eyesight is she sees herself for the first time. She sees how she looks. She can now move around the apartment without the help. She can now leave. She can now come. She, she has a new level of freedom. And her husband's role changes, yes. of course, because she no longer counts on him all the time. And as we're watching this movie, I am just getting so angry at this husband character. And I turn to my wife and I say, here's the thing to my wife, Jacqueline. I say, you know what? When we got really fit and you lost all this weight, I didn't get jealous. I felt proud because I'm like, this is my wife. Like the more you do, the more it represents me because I picked you and you picked me. And this husband is only looking at the stuff he's losing when the wife suddenly starts to become more attractive. And now he's getting insecure and worried maybe people will hit on him. She's starting to go out into the world and now she doesn't need him anymore. And and the whole time I'm going, I, if, the, the husband is doing this wrong. The husband should yes. be celebrating yes. his spouse's growth because if he did it, he would actually even align with her, grow with her and keep her. But instead, there's this wall that can be divided because now she's seeing that he's holding her back, it's holding so back true. her dreams. And so for anyone who like That's this good. movie so perfectly captured for me, the entrepreneurial journey of... I want to go and live a bigger life and and see a bigger world and step outside and get my vision back. And I want to be more attractive and more confident. I don't want to count on the boss or the salary or the paycheck or my small community. There are bigger things for me. And and so if I could just encourage you to, to give your spouse a chance... But but even maybe have them watch this movie and say, you are doing what the husband's doing. Stop being so insecure. <laughs> the, the brighter I shine, the more awesome you are because I choose you. Yeah, it's so very true. Okay, I have to watch that movie. It is such a perfect example. But what I want people to hear is that if you have a spouse or a partner that doesn't believe you should go out and do this and quit your job and start your business... First, have compassion for them. They are afraid. They're afraid you won't have enough um, money in the household, maybe. They're afraid that they could lose you, possibly. They're, they have a lot of fears, and I like to have a lot of empathy and compassion for that. But then at the same time, you, as the budding entrepreneur, need to remember, oh, maybe they are afraid that I will shine, that I will grow bigger, that I will be independent. And those are all the things you should be. So whether they're afraid or not, that's why I say you do it anyway. I love it. And and I'm a huge fan of Sarah Blakely who started a Spanx. And if Same. I'm going from memory here, but I think she didn't tell anyone for two years or okay. something. Like, I tell it was that crazy. story all the time. Oh, I'm so you? glad you know that. Yes. When Sarah Blakely cut the feet out of her pantyhose to create the first um, uh, prototype of Spanx, she said, I didn't tell 
anyone or hardly anyone because she said, I would believe them if they told me it wouldn't work. That's how vulnerable we are in those moments. So hold your dreams close because not everyone deserves to know them. Uh, Amy, the the book is Two Weeks Notice and I would highly recommend it because it is one of the most tactical things. As I said off the start, I I don't think it was a good idea for you to write this book, but but you did. (laughs) You gave away all the secrets. So if you're thinking about starting a business or even if you... I mean, what I took from it was like, damn, I don't need to work out these scripts. They're right here. I can, I can right lift there. them. So you got to check out the book. It comes out It comes out in uh, February 21st, if you're listening uh, before February. Uh, last question for you. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to for you? Freedom. It comes down to freedom. Freedom to do what I want, when I want, how I want it. Freedom to create a life by my own desire, by my own design. And it means that I get to give back. We didn't talk a lot about that, but I get to give back in all the ways that I want to. The more money you make, the better you can do in this world. And so there's a huge focus in the book of let's make that money. You deserve it. And I do believe that more money and more impact, it gives you more freedom. 